gracious good day to one and all once again. Tis I, Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico. And here we are for the weekend edition of Emperor Norton's fantastic history vlog. And as always, we welcome our special guest superstar, the Countess Lola Montez. Good day, Countess. Good day, Your Majesty. And how are you doing? Splendid. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for joining in. Indeed. So please like us and subscribe and leave your comments below. This is episode number 160. Today is October 31st, 2020, our 229th day living under COVID-19 restrictions. So Countess, what do you have for us today? Oh, well, we have a lot of surprises today. We have our special guest, Miss Ima Cracker, later on, so stick with us. And I have some other fascinating parts of the history of San Francisco once again, per request. And that's about Big Bertha Heyman. Oh, have you ever heard of her, Your Majesty? Oh, yes, yes, we've seen her around. Oh, you didn't marry her, did no, you? No, 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 no. You no, didn't no. give her money, did you? No, no, How no. How about rice? So sorry to bring that up. <laughs> My goodness. Just a couple of programming notes before we continue. Uh, this is our first time back in a week, so good to see you all again. Uh, secondly, we are starting the new schedule next week. So the vlog will be once a week on Wednesdays, and then always the special show on the weekends with the Countess. But the Wednesday edition is going to be This Week in History, but instead of looking back, we're going to look forward. So tune in for that on Wednesday. It's going to be very exciting. Also, don't forget to vote. We're going to say that again at the end. So Countess, continue. Well, I was thinking, you know, did you hear the story about the man who approached a beautiful woman in a large supermarket? And he asked, do you know I've lost my wife here in the supermarket? Can we talk for a couple of minutes? Why? She says, well, because every time I talk to a beautiful woman, my wife appears out of nowhere. You know, Your Majesty, marriage is full of surprises. Mm. But it's mostly asking each other, do you have to do that right now? <laughs> do you know why the King of Hearts married the Queen of Hearts? No, why? They were perfectly suited for each other. The secret of a happy marriage remains a secret. <laughs> Grooms, if uh, any of you are out there listening, remember, once you've gotten married, when you have a discussion with your future spouse, always get the last words in. What would that be? Well... Yes, dear. <laughs> what is the penalty for bigamy? What's that? Two mother-in-laws. <laughs> you know, marriage is to become one. The trouble starts when you decide which one. You know, love is one long, sweet dream, and marriage is the alarm clock. <laughs> Some people say love is blind, and marriage is an eye-opener. <laughs> marriage is becoming more and more progressive. Hmm. I heard of two scoutmasters recently who decided to tie the knot. <laughs> A little boy asked his father, Daddy, how much does it cost to get married? 
And the father replied, I don't know, son. I'm still paying for it. <laughs> well, shall we move on to some history? I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, in the gold rush of San Francisco, so many people came from all over the world and they were seeking fortune. Now, there's an old rhyme that people used to say, the miners came in 49, the whores in 51, and when they got together, they created the native sun. Now, some of the folks made a bundle of money, or two or three, over selling tools to the miners. So not everybody was here to excavate. People such as yourself, your majesty, Indeed. came here to uh, invest and do business but others were, you know, like myself, we came here for entertainment and made a lot of money. I was making $15,000 a week my, my. when I was booked here in 1853. I arrived in May of that year, and that was quite a parcel of money, you might say, still to this day. So not everyone used a pick or a shovel to search for gold. Other people mine the miners mm. so think about that you know they they would take advantage of situations one such person became known as big bertha Heyman, mm. and she was a german jew that had arrived here and i'll tell you about her because she was a grifter and who was this woman in san francisco history we have to ask and pose these questions. In the early days of San Francisco, there were very few women, and I will consult my notes to make sure that I have all the facts for you. For the first European women that did arrive to the shores of the growing city of San Francisco, the opportunities could be boundless. Marriage, prostitution, entertainment, opening independent businesses or stretching boundaries although still not having the right to vote in a white male dominated society, there were at least better possibilities and opportunities in the golden state for women. Now you, your majesty, were way ahead of your time because you believe women should also have the right to vote. Absolutely, equality for all. Yes. Well, not all women chose the path of the straight and narrow. Many, many found that a life of crime did pay. Bertha Heyman was in her late 30s when she arrived to San Francisco, probably in the mid-1880s, originally from Germany. This middle-aged Jewish woman claimed to be a widow, making her way as best as she could in a lonely, expensive, dangerous, and male-dominated world. Bertha Heyman possessed a lot of charm, her demeanor was that of a poor, defenseless widow, not knowing the ways of the world. Well, let me tell you, Bertha, she was large, weighing nearly 300 pounds. In Herbert Asbury's book, The Barbary Coast, he describes Big Bertha as a sprightly lass of 280 pounds, claiming to be a wealthy Jewish widow in search of a man to help protect her fortune. Now, in February 1888, Bertha Stanley visited Dr. Messing, now chief rabbi of the congregation Beth Israel. And when she was accompanied by her stepson, Willie. She told the rabbi that she had inherited $300,000, and by today's standards, that is six billion. My. She had inherited it, she said, from her husband, who was Christian, but she wanted her next marriage to be with someone of her same faith, Judaism. Now, Bertha offered $1,000 to the person who would find her a thoroughly acceptable Jewish husband. You know, they say Jewish men make the best husbands. That's true. I will attest. Anyway, 
Yes. So, she visited Dr. Messing frequently and met Messing's brother-in-law, Abraham Grun, hmm. a wealthy businessman. Now, Abraham Grun was charmed and fell madly in love with Bertha and proposed marriage within a few days. There were many others to follow. Soon, Bertha charmed her way to the top social class of Beth Israel, giving a check for $1,000 to the congregation hmm. and hinting at much more to come. She was the guest of honor at numerous soirees and managed to acquire an extensive wardrobe, including jewelry, either as gifts or on credit. Hmm. Bertha told Grun her stepson was opposed to the marriage, and Grun lent Willie $500 as a way of softening the, his resistance. Hmm. Then Bertha and Willie departed to Los Angeles, pausing only to pawn the more expensive jewelry. When Bertha's check bounced, Grun became suspicious and visited Isaiah Lees, San Francisco's captain of detectives. Upon hearing Bertha's description, Lees reached for a book, turned to photograph number 122, and showed it to Grun. Is this the woman? He inquired. A shocked Abraham Grun nodded yes. The book was, and I quote the title, Professional Criminals of America mm. by Thomas F. Burns, New York City's Chief of Detectives. The description read, Bertha Heyman, alias Big Bertha, the Confidence Queen, and I unquote. The book, written in 1886, detailed her many swindles and noted she was currently incarcerated. Her sentence will expire in 1887. She has the reputation of being one of the smartest confident women in America. Burns wrote also, she possesses a wonderful knowledge of human nature and can deceive those who consider themselves particularly shrewd in business matters. A warrant for Bertha's arrest was issued and she and Willie fled Los Angeles but were captured in Texas. Hmm. Now, the truth be told, Willie was not really, I hate to break the news, he was not really her nephew. He was a lover. Mm -hmm. And so they were captured in Texas, but with calm confidence, Bertha was the picture of outraged innocence and soon became a press favorite. Ned Foster saw an opportunity and launched Bertha into a theatrical career. He bailed her out of jail, then booked her into San Francisco's Woodward Garden. 18,000 people streamed in to see her and hear her paint herself as the victim in her poem, The Confidence Queen. Mm. And I quote, here's, here's a sample of that poem. So when vain grasping men pant for glittering gold and find their bonanza in me, it is wicked to show up how badly they're sold and the rogues that men can sometimes be. Hmm. That's the end of the part of the poem. Bertha was acquitted in the trial and the judge scolded her, telling her to find honest moral uh, livelihood and not to prey on the good polite citizens of San Francisco. Many of the men Bertha had duped were embarrassed to come forward as witnesses out of shame. Also, some that of those she had taken advantage of were already married. Mm. She had wooed them, had lured them into problems, uh, and her partner in crime, Willie, was convicted and sent to San Quentin oh for a short stretch. Now, Ned Foster and, and Jack uh, Hollion were managers, uh, excuse me, I stand corrected, Hollinan, Jack Hollinan, were managers of the Bell Union and Cremor Melodians. They recognized the potential of Big Bertha. She was put in an empty storefront on Market Street on display and for 10 cents, 
she would at regular intervals rise from her reinforced chair and tell her sad stories, recounting the last of dreadful crimes that she had committed in San Francisco and other cities with vivid details. Mm. People loved it. She would sing off key to her audiences, the only two songs she ever knew, A Flower from My Angel Mother's Grave and The Cabin Where the Old Folks Died. Her shows were very popular. Bertha also performed at the Bottle Coning Stage. Big Bertha was cast as Malzeppa as Lord Byron's hero. In the play, her character is punished for having had an affair with a young countess. Can you imagine? Mm. Mm. And is strapped to the horse as punishment. However, instead of a horse, they used a donkey. Now, in earlier episodes, we talked about uh, Ada Isaac Menken, who came mm -hmm. to San Francisco, and she did a very rousing uh, version of Melzeppa playing the male part of the prince being strapped to the horse. She was wearing nearly nothing. The idea was she wanted to look nude, so they had nude tights on her. And it was quite the hit in San Francisco. Well, this was kind of a comedy using Big Bertha as a result. Now, they strapped her to the donkey and it all went horribly wrong. The donkey lost its footing, straining under Bertha's weight and crashed into the orchestra pit, taking Bertha with it. And Bertha's career continued with bookings in the Bell Union, San Francisco's most popular hall. She discovered her lack of talent was no barrier to popularity. And Bertha was paired with Oofty Goofty, a Barbary Coast character who made his living as a human punching bag. Oofty Goofty was in previous episode uh, vlog number 145, if you want to hear all about him. And that's a whole story right there. Indeed. Well, they staged a boxing match on their... Um, and they put Bertha against uh, Oofty Goofty, and invariably she would knock him out in a stroke of comic genius. And Ned Foster cast them both in a Shakespearean play, Romeo and Juliet. Mm. Now, because of Big Bertha's weight, the love scene put Oofty Goofty in the balcony and Big Bertha on the stage floor. One day, Bertha confided in her manager that her suitcase had a false bottom containing $10,000 in Canadian bonds and thousands of dollars in jewelry. She asked him to handle the, scale, uh, the sale for her of some of those jewels and some of the bonds. And while they negotiated over the next few days, Bertha borrowed small sums of money from Foster. He agreed to pay her $1,600 for the trunk, but before doing so, he snuck into her room and discovered the false bottom was a fake. The moment I discovered a man is a fool, I let him drop, but I delight in getting him into confidence and the pockets of men who think they can be skinned, Big Bertha would say. And she also would say, it ministers my intellectual pride. Bertha also claimed not to care about the money she made and said she gave some away to needy people. Mm. The records show otherwise. Doesn't this sound like familiar? A little bit, yes. Mm. Mm. Like most con artists, <clears throat> Bertha robbed from everyone and kept everything. Stardom is fickle. Big Bertha proved a very popular attraction. And then, as the public started to lose the interest in her novelty and her stories, she disappeared from the streets of San Francisco as easily as the San Francisco fog can sometimes vanish away into the horizon. She was never heard from again. My, my. And so that's the story of our big Bertha here in San Francisco. What a fascinating story. She was larger than life, wasn't she? In a way of saying it, yes. Hmm. 
So what else do we have today, Countess? Well, I think today we are going to have Miss I'm a Cracker. Oh, boy. And she can charm the feathers off a duck and would charm the dew right off the honeysuckle. She can rock them high heel shoes, but she'd rather wear cowboy boots. The diva of country western music, here to sing Your Cheatin' Heart. From the horny bull bareback bar in Kyleen, Texas, we're going to have Miss I, I'm a Cracker. But we have to conjure her in. Oh, she's not here? No. Ooh. We have to call her up. Oh, my. So I will consult the crystal. I love you little, I love you big. I love you like a big fat pig. Miss, I'm a cracker. Your cheating heart will make you weep. You cry and cry and try to sleep, but sleep won't come the whole night through. Your cheating heart will tell on you. When tears come down like falling rain, you'll toss around and call my Walk the floor the way I do. Your cheating heart is gonna tell on you when tears come down like falling. You toss around and call my name. You're gonna walk the floor the way I do. Your cheating heart is gonna tell. a fun trip. Wasn't it? How delightful. Miss I'm a cracker. Oh my goodness. That was lovely there. Your cheating heart is going to tell on you. Let that be a lesson. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Countess, for a fascinating story. So that about wraps it up for this edition. Now remember, we're coming back on Wednesday with a new weekly show. It'll cover an entire week. Don't forget to leave comments down below and like and subscribe. If you would like to leave us a tip, and they are greatly appreciated, here's the information for that. You can donate through Patreon, Venmo, or PayPal, and we greatly appreciate all of our wonderful donors. We couldn't do it without you. Also, if you would like more information on our tours, now we are restarting. Uh, next Saturday, November 9, November 7, pardon me, and every Saturday at 11 a.m. from Union Square, but groups are limited to 10 or 12. You must wear a mask. You must socially distance. If you can't do those things, you are not allowed to take the tour. So here's more information on that. So until we see you again, stay safe, stay healthy. If you go outside, wear a mask. Be kind to one another and don't forget to vote. 
Until we see you again, a gracious good day. Au revoir.